ώστε να αρχίσουμε καλησπέρα. Εκλεκτή ομίγυρη, η Ακαδημία Αθηνών υποδέχεται σήμερα με ιδιαίτερη τιμή και χαρά τον κύριο Πίτερ Τζον Μπάνς, καθηγητή πνευμολογίας στο Imperial College του Λονδίνου, ως ξένο εταίρο της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών στον κλάδο της ιατρικής πνευμονολογίας στην πρώτη τάξη των θετικών επιστημών. Ο καθηγητής Μπάνς ανήκει στους κορυφαίους παγκοσμίως πνευμονολόγους λόγω της σημαντικής ερευνητικής προσφοράς του στην κατανόηση των μηχανισμών παθογένειας και θεραπείας του άσθματος και της χρόνιας αποφρακτικής πνευμονοπάθειας. Παρακαλώ τον ακαδημαϊκό κύριο Χαράλα Μπορούσο να προσέλθει στο βήμα και να παρουσιάσει το έργο του νέου συναδέλφου. Θα ακολουθήσει η ομιλία του κυρίου Πίτερ Τζον Μπάντς με θέμα «Can we reverse age-related diseases to prolong healthy life» Κύριε Ρούσο. Ο καθηγητής Πίτερ Μπάρνς είναι μεταξύ των κορυφαίων πνευμονολόγων στον κόσμο λόγω της ερευνητικής προσφοράς του στην κατανόηση των μηχανισμών παθογένειας και θεραπείας του άσματος και της χρόνιας αποφρακτικής πνευμονοπάθειας. Τα δύο αυτά νοσήματα είναι τα πλέον διαδεδομένα του πνεύμονα παγκοσμίω. Έχει δημοσιεύσει άνω των 1.500 εργασιών και άνω των 50 βιβλίων και κατατάσσεται στους 10 πρώτους, πότε τέταρτος, πότε πέμπτος, πότε έκτος, από πλευράς αναφορών, citations, μεταξύ όλων των επιστημόνων σε όλες τις επιστήμες, με τον εντυπωσιακό H-Index άνω του 220. Απέκτησε το προκλινικό πτυχίο στο Cambridge, εν συνεχεία του παθολόγου στην Οξφόρδη, στο Brompton, στο Hammersmith, στο University College, Επήρε τον τίτλο του Μάστερ από το Βασιλικό Κολέγιο Ιατρών και τον τίτλο του Ετέρου του Ιδίου Κολεγίου το 1986. Το 1978 άρχισε έρευνα στην πνευμονολογία και εστίασε τις μελέτες του στη φαρμακολογία του άσθματος αποκτώντας με βάση τη διατριβή που υπέβαλε διδακτορικό δίπλωμα στην Οξφόρδη. Στη συνέχεια ακολούθησε εκπαίδευση εξειδίκευσης στην πνευμονολογία στο Χάμερσμιθ και ακολούθως μετέβη στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες στο Ινστιτούτο το Ερευνητικό της Καλιφόρνιας στο Σαν Φρανσίσκο. Κατά τη διάρκεια των μηνών αυτών ανέπτυξε καινοτόμες τεχνικές για να χαρακτηρίσει και να εντοπίσει αδρενεργικούς και χολινεργικούς υποδοχή στους πνεύμονες. Επέστρεψε στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο ως επίκουρος καθηγητής στη πνευμονολογία στη Βασιλική Μεταπτυχιακή Ιατρική Σχολή και σύμβουλος ιατρός στο νοσοκομείο Χάμερσμιθ. Εκεί ανέπτυξε πνευμονολογικό ερευνητικό εργαστείο προκειμένου να διερευνήσει τους φλαγμονώδεις μηχανισμούς του άσθηματος. Κατέλαβε την πρώτη έδρα δε πνευμονολογίας το 1985 συγγνώμη της πνευμονολογικής κλινικής φαρμακολογίας στο Μπρόμπτον που δημιουργήθηκε στο Καρδιοθωρακικό Ινστιτούτο στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Λονδίνου το οποίο μετονομάσχε σε Εθνικό Ινστιτούτο Καρδιάς και Πνευμόνων. Δημιούργησε δραστήριο ερευνητικό τμήμα και άρχισε να πρωτοπορεί στο πεδίο της αναπνευστικής φαρμακολογίας που την εποχή εκείνη ανεπτύσσεται. Μετά από δύο χρόνια κατέλαβε την πολύ διάσημη έδρα της Ιατρικής Θόρακος στο Εθνικό Συμβούλιο Καρδιάς και Πνευμόνων. Είναι η μεγαλύτερου κύρους έδρα πνευμονολογίας στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο, την οποία κατέχει εδώ και 30 χρόνια. Παράλληλα, ανέπτυξε ένα ερευνητικό τμήμα πνευμονολογίας που είναι το μεγαλύτερο στην Ευρώπη και μεταξύ των πέντε κορυφαίων στον κόσμο. Υπήρξε εξαιρετικά παραγωγικός και πρωτοπόρος ερευνητής και διερεύνησε πολλά επιστημονικά πεδία σχετικά με το άσθημα και τη χρόνια αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια, ακολουθώντας ευρύτατες διεπιστημονικές προσεγγίσεις από την κλινική παρατήρηση μέχρι την μεταφραστική έρευνα. Διερεύνησε τη φύση της πνευμονής στο άσθημα και των ρόλων των διαφόρων φλεγμονωδών διαμεσολαβητών στην ασθένεια αυτή και το πώς συμβάλλουν στην υπερευαισθησία και συμπτωματολογία της αναπνευστικής οδού. 
Η αρχική του έρευνα εστιάστηκε στους νευρικούς και αυτόνομους μηχανισμούς ελέγχου της αναπνευστικής οδού, τον ρόλο των αδερνεργικών μηχανισμών και τις συνσφορές διαφόρων νευροπεπτιδίων που εδράζουν στα νεύρα της ανθρώπινης αναπνευστικής οδού. Υπήρξε ο πρώτος που χαρτογράφησε τους αδρενεργικούς και τους χολινεργικούς υποδοχείς στους πνεύμονες και περιέγραψε τη λειτουργία και ρύθμισή τους. Πολλές από τις θεραπευτικές αγωγές που ακολουθούνται για το άσθμα και την χρόνια αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια ενεργούν μέσω της διάδρωσης με αυτούς τους α... αυτόνομους υποδοχής. Γεγονός που προσέφερε κατανόηση των μηχανισμών δράσης των β' αδρενεργικών αγωνιστών και αντιχολυνεργικών υποδοχέων, οι οποίοι σήμερα χρησιμοποιούνται ως οι κύριες βροχοδιασταλτικές φαρμακευτικές παρεμβάσεις. Ανακάλυψε πρώτος τη μακρά διάρκεια δράσης του μουσκαρενικού ανταγωνιστή βρωμιού χωτιοτρόπιο, καταδεικνύοντας πόσο αποκλειστικό ήταν με μία και μοναδική χορήγηση ημερησίας. Αυτό έχει πλέον κατα... καταστεί το πιο διαδεδομένο προχωδιασταλτικό για την αντιμετώπιση των ασθενών με ΧΑΠ. Ανακάλυψε ότι ένα άλλο φάρμακο, το γλυκοπυροβέιτ, είχε παρατεταμένη δράση στους μουσκαρενικούς επίσης υποδοχής και είχε ανάλογη δράση. Αναγνώρισε μη αδρενεργικά βροχοδιασταλτικά νεύρα στην ανθρώπινη αναπνευστική οδό και κατέδειξε ότι ο νευροδιαβιβαστής αυτών των νεύρων ήταν το μονοξίδιο του αζότου. Αυτός ο μηχανισμός μπορεί να είναι διασπαρμένος στο άσθμα προκαλώντας υπερευαισθησία της αναπνευστικής οδού. Διεξήγαγε εκτεταμένη έρευνα για να κατανοήσει τη μοριακή βάση της αντιφλεγμονόδους δράσης των κορτικοειδών στο άσθμα. Απέδειξε τη σημασία της ακετηλίωσης των ιστονών στην ενεργοποίηση πολυλαπλών αντιφλεγμονωδών γονιδίων σε ασθματικές αναπνευστικές οδούς και τον ρόλο των κορτικοστεροειδών στην πρόσληψη της ιστονικής διακετηλάσης. Προκειμένου να αντιστραφεί η διεργασία και τη λύωση και να άδρανοποιηθούν τα φλεγμονώδη γονίδια. Σε αντίθεση με το άσθμα, η χρόνια αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια είναι ανθεκτική στην αντιφλεγμονώδη δράση των κορτικοστεροειδών. Και ο καθής Μπάρνς κατέδειξε ότι αυτή εξηγείται με την μειωμένη δραστικότητα και έκφραση της ιστονικής διακετηλάσης λόγω του υψηλού οξυδοτικού στρες στη χρόνια αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια. Αυτό το αποτέλεσμα του οξυδοτικού στρες προκαλεί το μέσο της ενεργοποίησης της φωσφοϊνοησιτιδίνης τρία κινάσης, οπότε οι αναστολή της κινάσης αυτής μπορούσαν να αναστρέψουν την αντίσταση των κυτάρων ασθενών με χρονία αποφρακτική ανεπάρκεια στα κορτικοειδή. Αυτό το αποτέλεσμα μιμείται επί μακρόν το χρησιμοποιούμενο φάρμακο θεοφιλίνη και χρησιμοποιήθηκε σε μικρές δόσεις στους ασθενείς. Ένα άλλο πεδίο στο οποίο ο καθηγητής Μπάρν υπήρξε πρωτοπόρος είναι η μέτρηση δύο δεκτών φλεγμονής στην αναπνοή για τη διάγνωση και παρακολούθηση ασθενών με αναπνευστικούς νόσους. Το εργαστήριό του ήταν το πρώτο που κατέδειξε ότι τα επίπεδα του μονοξιδίου του αζότου στο εκπνεόμενο αέρα μπορεί να παρακολουθήσουν τα θεραπευτικά αποτελέσματα των εισπνεωμένων κορτικοστεροειδών στο άσθημα. Η τεχνική του εκπνεώμενου μονοξιδίου του αζότου αποτελεί πλέον τον κλασικό τρόπο παρακολούθησης της απόκρισης στη θεραπεία ασθενών με άσθημα. Διερεύνησε επίσης και άλλους βιοδείκτες σε συμπίκνωμα εκνοής και ανέδειξε διαταραχές σε ασθενείς με άσθημα και χρονία αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια. Πιο πρόσφατα, η έρευνά του εστιάστηκε στους βασικούς μηχανισμούς που διέπουν την χρονία αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια. Ένα χαρακτηριστικό των ασθενών είναι ότι η κατώτερη αναπνευστική οδός και οι πνεύμονες απεικούνται από βακτήρια όπως ο αιμόφυλος Ινφλέντσα. Η εργαστηριακή του ομάδα βρήκε στην συνέχεια ότι αυτή η παραμονή των βακτηριδίων στους πνεύμονες εξηγείται από την ελληματική απομάκρυση των βακτηρίων από τα κύψελιδικά μακροφάγα και αυτό φαίνεται να εξηγείται από την διαταραγμένη 
λειτουργία των μικροσωληνίσκων των μακροφάγων. Ένα άλλο σημαντικό πεδίο της ερευνάς του είναι η μελέτη του μηχανισμού της επιταχυνόμενης γύρανσης του πνεύμονα, που παρατηρείται στη χρονή αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια και την πνευμονική ίνωση. Δηλαδή, παρατηρείται συσσόρευση γερασμένων κυτάρων στους πνεύμονες, που φαίνεται να οφείλεται σε απώλεια αντιγυραντικών μορίων, όπως οι σιρτουίνες, που ανάγονται από το οξυδοτικό στρες μέσω της δραστηριότητας μερικών μικροαρενέ. Δεσμεύοντας αυτά, το κρίσιμα μικροαρενέ είναι δυνατόν να αντιστραφεί η διαδικασία γύρασης των κυτάρων στην χρονή αποφρακτική πνευμονοπάθεια, οδηγώντας έτσι δυνητικά σε νέες θεραπευτικές προσεγγίσεις. Αυτά και πολλά άλλα, και δεν θα έπρεπε να μιλάω επί πολλή ώρα, βραβεύτηκε με πάρα πολλές διακρίσεις. Ήταν καταρχήν δημιουργός και ενεργό μέλος της Ακαδημίας Ιατρικής Επιστήμης που ιδρύθηκε το 1998 ως ένα κορυφαίο ιατρών ερευνητών στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο και στη συνέχεια μετήχε στο Διοικητικό Συμβούλιο για δύο έτη. Εξελέγει, όπως είπα και πριν, μέλος της διάσημης βασιλικής εταιρείας το 2007 σε αναγνώριση της πρωτοπόρου ερευνάς του είναι το διάσημο FRS όπως ξέρουμε και να είναι ο πρώτος επιστήμονας ερευνητής του αναπνευστικού συστήματος που κατέλαβε αυτή την υψηλού κύρος διάκριση τα τελευταία 150 χρόνια. Εξελέγει Master Fellow του Αμερικανικού Κολογίου Θόρακος. Εξελέγει επίσης μέλος της Αμερικανικής Εταιρείας Ιατρών που περιλαμβάνει 500 διακεκριμένους επιστήμονες και είναι ένας από τους ολίγους τους κλινικούς ερευνητικούς ιατρός εκτός Αμερικής. Είναι μέλος της Ακαδημία Ευρωπαία και μέλος της Ακαδημίας Επιστημών της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Το 2020 το απενεμήθη στην Αμερική το διάσημο βραβείο το τριντό Metal. Έχει λάβει τιμητικά διπλώματα από αρκετά ευρωπαϊκά πανεπιστήμια, συμπεριλαμβανωμένων της Φεράρα στην Ιταλία, των Αθηνών, του, της στη Φιλανδία, της Λουβέν, του Μάστρεχτ. Υπήρξε πρόεδρος της Ευρωπαϊκής Πνευμονολογικής Εταιρείας, της μεγαλύτερης πνευμονολογικής εταιρείας στον κόσμο, το διάστημα 13 με 14. Είναι μέλος του Πανεπιστημίου Σεντ Κάθριν College στο Κέμπριτς και επίσης υπήρξε και μέλος της Fleischner Society. Έδωσε πολύ άριθμες σημαντικές διαρροτλέξεις, συμπεριλαμβάνομένης τη Σαντού Λέξουρ στην Ευρωπαϊκή Πνευμονολογική Εταιρεία και της Άμπερσον Λέξουρ στην Αμερικανική Εταιρεία Θόρακα. Πρώτη φορά κάποιος Ευρωπαίος επιστήμονας έδωσε αυτή τη σημαντική διάλεξη στην Αμερική. Επίσης, έδωσε και την διάσημη διάλεξη την Cronian Lecture στο Βασιλικό Κολέγιο των Ιατρών. Αυτές είναι οι σημαντικότερες και υπάρχουν δεκάδες για να μην πω δεκαδοντάδες άλλες διαλέξεις σε όλο τον κόσμο. Υπηρέτησε στα συντακτικά συμβούλια πολλών σπουδαίων επιστημονικών περιοδικών, όπως θα αναφέρω λίγα, στο New England Journal of Medicine, στο American Journal of Respiratory Medicine, στο CHEST, στο Journal of Applied Physiology και άλλα και άλλα και άλλα. Επιπροσθέτως, ήταν ο ιδρυτικός συντάκτης δύο περιοδικών του Pulmonary Pharmacology και του Therapeutics και Respiratory Research που εξακολουθούν να ανθούν. Άριστος εκπαιδευτής. Εκπαίδευσε πάνω από 100 κλινικούς και μη κλινικούς επιστήμονες στην πνευμονολογία, πολλοί εκ των οποίων έχουν τώρα γίνει κορυφές στις χώρες τους και σε αυτό το πεδίο. Συνεισέφερε επίσης κεφάλαια σε σημαντικά εγχειρίδια, όπως το κλασικό βιβλίο παθολογίας του Χάρισον και το σύγγραμμα φαρμακολογίας Goodman and Gilman. Είναι αρχισυντάκτης της επίκαιρης πνευμονολογίας, το γνωστό up-to-date, της πλέον διαδεδομένης πηγής αναφοράς για τους κλινικούς. Έχει γράψει ή επιμεληθεί 
πάνω από 50 βιβλία σχετικά με το άσθμα, τη χρόνια αναπνευστική πνευμονοπάθεια, τη πνευμονική φαρμακολογία και άλλα σχετικά θέματα. Ο δεσμός του με την Ελλάδα υπήρξε μακρόχρονος και στενός. Έχει στενούς δεσμούς με πνευμονολόγους στην Ελλάδα. Εδώ και πολλά χρόνια έχει εκπαιδεύσει αρκετούς κλινικούς ερευνητές από την Ελλάδα, όπως ο Ιωάννης Κιουμής, ο Στέλιος Λουκίδης, η Βίκη Κατσαούνου, η Κοραλία Πασχαλάκη, ο Κρίστος Ρώσιος, η Αδριάνο Παπιωάνο και άλλα. Το αμεπενεμήθη ο τίτλος του επίτιμου διδάκτορα από το Πανεπιστήμιο Αθηνών και διαδραμάτισε κομβικό ρόλο στα μαθήματα μεταπτυχιακών σπουδών State of the Art που οργανώθηκαν στην Αθήνα επί 15 χρόνια από την Κλινική Εντατικής Θεραπείας σε συνεργασία με την Πνευμονολογική Εταιρεία. Συνεχίζει δε να αναλαμβάνει συνεργατικές μελέτες με επιστήμονες από την Ελλάδα όπως θα αναπτύξουμε αύριο στην Πνευμονολογική Εταιρεία. Συμπερασματικά, ο Πίτερ Μπάρνς είναι ένας από τους αδιαμφισβήτητους κορυφαίους επιστήμονες και ο πιο συχνά αναφερόμενος κλινικός ερευνητής στην Ευρώπη στον τομέα της ιατρικής έρευνας στην πνευμονολογία. Δημιούργησε ένα από τα πιο παραγωγικά εργαστήρια στην πνευμονολογική έρευνα, πνευμονολογική έρευνα στον κόσμο. Οι επιστημονικές ανακαλύψεις του άλλαξαν το ρου της πνευμονολογίας διότι αναδιαμόρφωσαν την αντίληψη και τη θεραπεία των κυριότερων ασθενειών του αναπνευστικού συστήματος. Τέλος, είναι μέντορας και συνεργάτης πολλών ενήλων πλεμονολόγων. Η αγάπη του δε για την Ελλάδα είναι άξια ιδιαίτερης αναφοράς. Για όλα τα νοτέρω, ο Πίτερ Μπάρνς εξελέγει στην Ακαθημία Αθηνών με την υψίστη διάκριση του ξένου εταίρου. Dear colleague, I will, you will now receive the medal and diploma of the Foreign Fellow of our Academy. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and first of all, I'd like to say what an enormous honor it is to be inducted into your prestigious academy. Um, I particularly want to thank my friend Harris Roussos, who I've known for so many years, for enabling this honor. Um, in choosing the topic to discuss, I wanted to choose something that would be of general interest, but also related to our research. And I think now we have a much better understanding of the aging process. It is becoming feasible to imagine that we can soon have treatments that will be able to reverse all age-related diseases and prolong healthy life. So humans have always been searching for the elixir of life, which comes from the Arabic word elixir, meaning miracle substance. And this is a substance that prolongs youth, gives eternal life and cures all diseases. This was first mentioned in ancient Mesopotamia in the story of Gilgamesh, who went in search of the elixir of life, but was never successful in finding it. In ancient Chinese culture, 
It was thought that if you could liquefy and consume gold, that you would live forever, which was not achieved. And of course, in ancient Greek, ambrosia was the food of the gods, which conferred immortality. More recently, we have the water of life in Gallic is called Wiskbetha, which is now called whiskey. Um, and in Harry Potter, um, he searched for the Philosopher's Stone, which is necessary to create the elixir of life. So this has been a long-standing search of humans to find something that could achieve these effects. But now we have more and more people in the world who are aging. And a shocking statistic of aging is that of all the humans who've ever reached the age of 65 years, more than half of them are alive today. And what is even more shocking is that the number of people in the world over 65 will double just in the next 25 years. And you can see that this trajectory is rapidly taking off. So a third of the people born in the UK now are likely to live to be 100 years. And the longer you live, the more likely you are to accumulate age-related diseases. Age-related diseases are non-communicable diseases, which are by far the commonest cause of death and disease burden in the world. And the most important non-communicable diseases are diseases of accelerated aging. So these include cardiovascular diseases, which are the commonest cause of death, COPD, which I'm going to talk about, and then other diseases like uh, bone and metabolic diseases, kidney disease, and Alzheimer's disease. But elderly people often have more than one of these age-related diseases. So if you look at people over 60, 65% will have more than two age-related diseases. And we think this is because there are shared molecular pathways. So these diseases are comorbidities of each other. But this, comor this multimorbidity is increasing. So people with three or more of these diseases in, in the UK increased by 50% in the last 10 years or so. So this is a huge problem for medicine to deal with all of these people with chronic diseases. And this is extremely expensive. Um, it's estimated that the costs of multimorbidity of the elderly will be $50 trillion a year, by far the greatest expense of all medical diseases. So we need to understand more about the process that leads to these diseases and we work on COPD, which is a very good disease to study this phenomenon in because it's a very common disease and it's easy to obtain samples to understand the underlying mechanism. COPD is an enormous burden to the world. It affects around 350 million people in the world, around 10% of people over the age of 45. In Western countries, it's now equally common in women as in men, because women smoke as much as men, but it remains underdiagnosed. It has a high morbidity, and in the UK at least, is the commonest cause of hospital admission. It has a high mortality and is now ranked the third commonest cause of death in the world and has a high cost. So in the USA, it's costing almost $40 billion a year, far greater than the costs of asthma. 
and yet it's increasing especially in developing countries where more people are smoking, especially women. But the increase is largely because people are not dying of other diseases like infection. And it's closely associated with poverty, which is linked to a poor diet and poor air. So there are major unmet therapeutic needs in this disease. We don't have any treatment at the moment that reduces the progression of this disease or its mortality. And that's because we don't have any treatment that targets the underlying disease process, in contrast to asthma. So we know that chronic inflammation is a driving mechanism for COPD with many inflammatory cells in the lung that are recruited from the blood. And especially you see neutrophils and macrophages. And all of these cells are activated to release multiple inflammatory mediators. At the moment, over 100 mediators have been found to be increased in COPD. And it's the combination of these mediators that produces the pathology of the disease. The most important pathology is small airway fibrosis, which is the initial part of the disease, accounting for early disease progression with airway obstruction leading to progressive shortness of breath. Later on, you get emphysema with destruction of the alveolar walls and you also have mucus hypersecretion. So it's obvious that we should target inflammation to reduce disease progression and mortality. And this could be done by blocking mediators that are increased in COPD, such as TNF. But so far, every mediator antagonist that's been tested in COPD patients has failed to produce any clinical improvement. And you may think that that's because blocking one mediator is not going to have any effect on the other 99 mediators that are still active. And that's why people have looked at more broad spectrum anti-inflammatory treatments. In contrast to asthma, the inflammation of COPD is not responsive to steroid treatment. So people have looked at other broad spectrum anti-inflammatory inhibitors, and these have all been unsuccessful or have unacceptable side effects. And that's why we have no treatment that is effective on the underlying disease process. But increasing evidence suggests that this disease may be driven by accelerated aging of the lung and cellular senescence. And we know that senescent cells release a certain pattern of inflammatory mediators, which include cytokines, chemokines, proteases, and growth factors that are driven by inflammatory, pro-inflammatory signaling pathways like NF-kappa B. This pattern of inflammatory mediators exactly mirrors the inflammatory pattern that we see in COPD lungs, which is one of the reasons why we think that these senescent cells are causing the inflammation. And so in the future, we should look for a different approach to treatment using drugs that target the aging process, which are known as senotherapies. Normally, lung function declines very slowly with aging, but normal people never develop respiratory symptoms because they don't live long enough. But if you look at the lungs of very elderly people, you can see that they're abnormal with low density on CT scan because of increased air spaces, which leads to reduced gas diffusion. There's a reduction in elasticity of the lungs, 
the small airways become narrower, and there's a chronic inflammation. And these are very similar to the pathological changes that we see in COPD lungs, which is why we think that COPD represents acceleration of normal lung aging due to exposure to chronic oxidative stress from cigarette smoke or from air pollution like biomass smoke. And our hypothesis is that this acceleration is due to a loss of the normally protective endogenous anti-aging molecules such as sirtuins. And this leads to the accumulation in the lung of senescent cells. Every cell type in COPD lung shows senescence. But this is a pattern that we see in other chronic lung diseases like lung fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, some people with severe asthma, and pulmonary hypertension. So this is a, a common mechanism of chronic lung disease, which is why it's very important for pulmonologists to understand this process. We can measure cellular senescence easily because senescent cells stain a blue color when we stain for senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, which is a lysosomal enzyme. So senescent cells look blue. If you take airway epithelial cells in culture, expose them to an oxidative stress, which is bleach in this study, what you see is increased numbers of blue staining cells, demonstrating that the oxidative stress has induced senescence. If we now take epithelial cells from the small airways of COPD lungs, what you can see is an increased number of blue staining cells compared with an age-matched control that doesn't have COPD. And this is also true in the fibroblasts that surround airways in the alveolar type 2 cells which repair the damage of the alveoli and even outside the lung in endothelial progenitor cells which repair vascular damage. So we understand a lot more about the molecular pathways of senescence. This is something which occurs in all cells when they proliferate Repeated cell division leads to progressive shortening of telomeres, which eventually activate the DNA damage response, which then activates P53, a key regulatory molecule that leads to cell cycle arrest through the activation of the cyclin kinase inhibitor, P21. And these cells are then staining with this blue stain with SA beta gal, and this is known as replicative senescence. But there is another mechanism of senescence which can be driven by stress, including oxidative stress, which may come from cigarette smoke and air pollution, but also from activated inflammatory cells in the lung. And this oxidative stress activates a different pathway with the activation of P16, which also puts the cell into cell cycle arrest. But oxidative stress selectively damages the telomeres, and so it accelerates replicative senescence. So it can activate both pathways of senescence. And these senescent cells are unable to repair damage. They promote fibrosis around them, and they release these inflammatory mediators known as the SASP, which I described in the previous slide. Actually, the SASP induces further senescence, so senescence is spreading, and these senescent cells release reactive oxygen species, which adds further to the oxidative stress which is driving this process. 
So if we take the lungs from COPD patients and we look at small airways, we can see that they're different from the small airways of age-matched non-COPD patients. They're different because the airway is narrower, the airway wall is much thicker, and the airway is surrounded by fibrosis. And if we stain with senescent markers, P21 and P16, you can see that there's increased brown staining showing positive reactivity. And this is particularly seen in the small airway epithelial cells. So these two markers of senescence are increased in the peripheral lung of COPD patients. And this is correlated with increased expression of pro-inflammatory mediators like CXCL8, which attracts neutrophils to the lung, and MMP9, which breaks down elastin fibers in the lung. But normally, this senescence is defended by many endogenous anti-aging molecules, which are listed in this green box. What we found is that all of these molecules are reduced by oxidative stress, and all of them are found to be reduced in COPD lungs. The best described anti-aging molecules are sirtuins. And in particular, sirtuin-1, which is an extremely important molecule, which is conserved through evolution from bacteria through to humans. So you know that it's going to have a very important role. It's a protein deacetylase, which is important for cellular repair, resisting cellular stress, maintaining genomic stability. And through these mechanisms, prolonging the lifespan of all species that have so far been tested, including mammals. But if we now look at the peripheral lung of COPD patients, we see a marked reduction of sirtuin-1 protein and messenger RNA. And we also see a reduction of sirtuin-6. Both of these sirtuins have been shown to be linked to lifespan in many species. There are seven sirtuins in mammals, but only sirtuin 1 and 6 are reduced in COPD. The other sirtuins are preserved as normal. And these are the sirtuins that are linked to aging and lifespan. So we've been looking at the molecular pathways that may lead to the selective reduction of sirtuin-1 and sirtuin-6, but not affecting the other sirtuins. Oxidative stress inactivates a key enzyme called P10, which is inactivated because at its catalytic site, it has cysteine residues which become oxidized by oxidative stress, which inhibits the enzyme, and the levels go down. So you can see in the peripheral lung of COPD, there's a marked reduction of P10. P10 is the main inhibitor of PI3 kinase signaling, and so as a consequence of P10 being reduced, PI3 kinase is activated. The next step down is the mechanistic target of rapamycin called mTOR, and this is activated by PI3 kinase and is a key molecule in aging. In all age-related diseases, mTOR is activated. This then activates further cytokines, which lead to a selective reduction of sirtuins 1 and 6, leading to accelerated lung aging. So this um, oxidative stress 
uh, is reducing sirtuin 1 and 6. And reduction of sirtuin 1 has many effects related to aging. It activates P53, which leads to cell cycle arrest. It impairs mitochondrial function, DNA repair, and it activates inflammatory pathways with NF-kappa-B, for example, leading to the SASP. Sirtuin-6 has effects that are, are different, but it also activates the SAS response that reduces beta-catenin and reduces telomere length. And both of these um, sirtuins regulate antioxidant transcription factors. So this leads to a reduction of FOXO3 and NRF2, which you can't see. And that leads to the increased expression of multiple oxidants. So this markedly increases oxidative stress, which further drives senescence. So this all leads to cellular senescence and COPD. What we discovered is that the critical link between PI3 kinase mTOR signaling and the reduction in sirtuin 1 and 6 is a single microRNA called 34A. So microRNAs are short sequences of RNA that bind to messenger RNA to stop the messenger RNA making protein. And we know that 34A binds to sirtuin 1, but it also binds to sirtuin 6, but not to any of the other sirtuins. And what you can see in the panel is that 34A is increased in the peripheral lung of COPD patients. And this is correlated with the reduction in sirtuin 1 in the lung. We believe that small airway epithelial cells are the main effector cells in COPD, which are exposed to cigarette smoke and air pollution. And if we take these cells from COPD lungs, what we can see is a reduction of sirtuins 1 and 6, just as we could see in the peripheral lung, um, compared with age match controls. We can see increased senescence markers P21 and P16. And we can see increased expression of SASP inflammatory proteins like TNF-alpha, IL-6, MMP9. The useful thing about microRNAs is that they can be very specifically blocked by a mirror sequence called an antagomere. So we've introduced an antagomere, which is the green bar, into these COPD epithelial cells. And we've been able to reduce the 34A back down to normal through this procedure. So it's like giving an antagonist of 34A. And if we do that, we can restore sirtuin 1 and sirtuin 6 and we can decrease senescence. The characteristic of senescent cells is that they don't proliferate, they're in cell cycle arrest. So when we measure proliferation of these cells, we can see it's markedly depressed compared with the age match control. So not every cell is senescent, which is why you get some proliferation. But the remarkable and, that, and that's because the COPD cells are in cell cycle arrest. The remarkable thing is that when these cells are treated with the antagomere, that you can actually reverse the senescence. I think this is something that we were very surprised to find, but we've been able to reproduce it many times. This is what we call rejuvenation of senescent cells, and it does suggest that the aging process in COPD may be reversible if only we had the right treatments. 
So talking of treatments, now we understand the molecular pathways of senescence. This has identified many drugs that could inhibit this part, these pathways and therefore reduce cellular senescence. So these drugs are collectively known as senostatics. And many of these drugs are being looked into or people are working to find such drugs to treat age-related diseases. But the drugs that are in red type on the slide, metformin, rapamycin, and resveratrol, uh, are already available to give to humans. And they're effective at prolonging lifespan in animals and reversing age-related diseases, or at least stopping the progression of age-related diseases. But the most interesting new drugs are the ones called senolytics, which remove senescent cells from the tissue. So senolytics are a completely new approach to the treatment of human disease. They switch the cell from senescence into apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, so that the cell can die safely and can be removed from the tissue. So people searched for drugs that would have this property without affecting healthy proliferating cells. And the first drugs that had this property were BCL2 and BCL-XL inhibitors. So BCL2 is an anti-apoptotic molecule which keeps the cell in the senescent state, preventing it from dying. And what you can see is that one of these drugs, Naviticlax, which was the most potent of these drugs that they found, uh, is killing senescent cells, but having little effect on healthy proliferating cells. And that's because Naviticlax is inhibiting BCL2 and that's switching the cell into apoptosis, as you can see by the big increase of apoptosis with Naviticlax, but having little effect on normal cells. Now, this is a very important study from the Mayo Clinic, which is the group that have done the most pioneering work on senolytic therapies. So they took old mice and gave them an infusion of senescent cells and found that this markedly shortened the life of these old mice. So senescent cells are bad for you. But when they gave a senolytic cocktail, which was dacetinib and quercetin, they found that this could prolong survival. In fact, it prolong the survival of normal mice by about 30%. Uh, and that's also associated with better physical performance and a reduction of inflammatory cytokines that come from senescent cells in the circulation. So this is demonstrating that senescent cells can propagate senescence can cause frailty and reduce survival, whereas eliminating senescent cells can prevent this. So we can think of senescent cells as zombie cells, which are the living dead. So they persist and they will never die, but as long as they persist, they're releasing inflammatory mediators. So they have bad long-term effects leading to disease progression. And what you need to do is remove these cells by switching them to apoptosis so that the cells can be cleared from the tissue. And I've mentioned the BCL2 inhibitors, which were the first senolytic drugs that are effective as senolytics 
and this would be an appropriate approach in COPD because BCL2 is increased in the cells of COPD patients. A more effective approach was found to be FOXO4 inhibitors, which inhibit P53, um, and they, they have a similar effect in leading to the removal of senescent cells by switching them to apoptosis. And FOXO4 is also a good target for senolytics in COPD. So what's been found is that these senolytics are effective in animal models of accelerated aging. And these include IPF, atherosclerosis, chronic kidney disease, type 2 diabetes, the commonest causes of death and suffering. But recently, this has been found in animal models of COPD. So mice that are exposed to cigarette smoke develop emphysema after several months of exposure, just like humans can. And this is a destructive pathology. So you may imagine that it would be inconceivable to reverse this process. But when senolytic drugs were given to these mice, the lungs grew back exactly as normal, completely reversed the emphysema. And what they found is that the type 2 pneumocytes in the lung started to proliferate and repair the alveolar damage that had been caused by chronic cigarette smoke. So this is a remarkable finding, but something very optimistic for the future of chronic human disease. So we've been looking at senolytic treatments in COPD in vitro, and if you look at small airway epithelial cells that are senescent, uh, what you can see is that this FOXO4 inhibitor is inhibiting, uh, reducing the viability of COPD cells, but having little effect on the control cells. And if we take lung slices from COPD patients and treat them with Noviticlax, which inhibits BCL2, you also see inhibition of senescence markers and inflammatory cytokines. So it looks as though these approaches should also be successful in COPD in the future. And you may think senolytic therapies could be dangerous in humans because of their profound effect. But in a pilot study, the Mayo Clinic group have given the senolytic cocktail that works in animal models of aging to elderly people with diabetic kidney disease. And they've taken skin biopsies so they can measure senescent cells in the skin and have shown that after only three days of treatment with senolytic therapies, you can see a reduction in senescent cells after three weeks there's a reduction of inflammatory cytokines in the circulation, and you see increased precursor cells or progenitor cells that can repair damage. And these, this treatment is extremely well tolerated. From animal studies, it's thought you may only need to give this treatment every few months. Maybe once a year would be sufficient to have one or two days of treatment. So it's something like taking your car in to have it serviced when they change the oil. They could do this every year and stop the accumulation of senescent cells that cause chronic disease. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is comorbidities because this is such an important aspect of COPD. So comorbidities are extremely common in COPD patients, and the most important comorbidities in COPD are also diseases of accelerated aging. So more than 90% of COPD patients have two or more 
comorbidities. So this is the normal situation in COPD. So oxidative stress um, is having a similar effect in aging of other organs. So in the vasculature, PI3 kinase mTOR signaling reduces sirtuin 1, which leads to increased arterial stiffness, which is a marker of vascular aging through a reduction of nitric oxide production by endothelial cells and a breakdown of elastin fibers in the blood vessel. And this underlies atherosclerosis and hypertension. But the reduction of sirtuin 1 also impairs the functioning of the heart. So that can lead to cardiac failure. This is the same pathway which is causing COPD, which suggests that lung aging and cardiovascular aging are linked. In fact, 70% of COPD patients have cardiovascular disease, and it's the commonest cause of death amongst patients with COPD. But this same pathway can account for most of the other comorbidities of COPD, such as type 2 diabetes, etc. And for skin wrinkling. So if you look at COPD patients, you see that they have more skin wrinkling than smokers that don't have airflow obstruction or non-smokers. And that may be because of the same pathway as activated in the skin with an increase in MMP9, which breaks down the elastin fibers in the skin. So it wrinkles. So we've been interested in aging outside the lung in COPD patients. And these are studies that were undertaken by Coralia Pashalaki who trained at the University of Athens and is a, a clinical research fellow in our department for several years. And she's done some brilliant work looking at endothelial progenitor cells, which you can isolate from the blood and then grow into blood vessels. And what she's found is that in COPD patients, the number of these precursor cells is not reduced, but their function is markedly reduced. So they fail to do what they're supposed to do, which is to repair damaged vessels. And that's because these cells in COPD are senescent, just like the lung cells, where you can see increased SA beta gal staining, increased P16 activation, and this is correlated with a reduction in sirtuin 1 activity. Extracellular vesicles are very important because they are the way that cells communicate with each other. And all cells produce vesicles, so we classify them mainly into large vesicles that come from the cell membrane on the surface and small vesicles that come from inside the cell, from the endoplasmic reticulum. And these vesicles contain RNA, including microRNA. And Justine Devolder in our department has been looking at these vesicles coming from small airway epithelial cells and has shown that there's a marked increase in the number of vesicles that come from COPD cells compared with age match controls. And you see an increase particularly of large vesicles, but also small vesicles. And these vesicles contain increased amounts of microRNA 34A. So this shows that these vesicles are abnormal and they can send a message to other cells that may be nearby or far away. So there's an active uptake of these vesicles by other cells 
and this is why these are a mechanism of cell-to-cell -cell communication. So a cell can send a message safely to another cell because the vesicles protect the RNA from enzymes that would degrade the RNA if they were freely released. And what you can see is that an airway epithelial cell is taking up the, um, let's see if I can get this to, maybe not, uh, taking up vesicles which we've labeled with a fluorescent marker. So these little green dots are the vesicles that have been taken up by this small airway epithelial cell. But if we expose the vesicles to a detergent to destroy the membrane, you can see there's no uptake of the green dye. So the vesicle is essential for getting into the cell. And you can see this uptake, which is actually similar in COPD cells as control cells. And the COPD vesicles are taken up just as well as the control vesicles. This is an active uptake process because at low temperatures, when there's no metabolic activity, there's no uptake. So it's an active process. So now we take normal small airway epithelial cells and expose them to vesicles from COPD cells. And what we can see is that the COPD vesicles lead to an increase in 34A, but not if we treat the vesicles with triton or remove them by centrifugation. And this means that the cell then has a reduction in sirtuin 1 and an increase in P21, indicating that the vesicles have transferred senescence from one cell to the other. And here you can see that these recipient cells have become senescent and they release inflammatory cytokines like IL-6. This is the critical experiment where we've taken the small airway epithelial cells and treated with them with the antagomere. And what you can see is that the uptake of 34A is then inhibited. So we've neutralized the 34A. And when we do that, we can restore sirtuin 1 and we can reduce markers of senescence. In other words, the senescence is mediated by the 34A contained in the vesicles from COPD cells. So these COPD cells are releasing a lot more vesicles, and these vesicles contain more 34A, which get taken up by non-senescent cells, which then become senescent. And so senescence spreads through the epithelium. But these vesicles can also be taken up by other cells. So we've shown that they can be taken up by fibroblasts, which may lead to fibrosis of the airway and can also be taken up by type 2 um, alveolar cells, which lead to emphysema. So these vesicles may spread the disease through the lung, accounting for disease progression. But these vesicles also get into the circulation and they can be taken up by other organs, for example, endothelial cells in the vasculature to induce senescence. And we think this is a mechanism that can therefore account for comorbidities in COPD. So the aging in the lung induces aging in the vasculature and the kidney and leads to diabetes. And this may explain why many of these age-related diseases become, come together, because these vesicles are passing between the organs of the body, causing parallel aging. We could also measure these vesicles in the blood, and so you have a biomarker of aging that could tell you about 
the mo which patients will benefit most from treatments. But we're also looking into the idea of using vesicles to deliver treatments like 34A antagomeres through engineered vesicles that are being developed at Imperial College. So the very last thing I want to discuss is some collaborative work that we've done with Professor Vasilis Gorgoulis and Coralia Pashalaki. Um, and this is looking at the role of senescence in COVID-19. So Vasilis Gorgoulis was able to obtain lung tissue from patients who had died of COVID lung disease. And what he was able to show is that the virus SARS-CoV-2 uh, is localized to the type 2 pneumocytes in the lung. And these cells that were infected with the virus stained with a new senescence marker that he developed called Centragore. And incidentally, these type 2 cells express the ACE2 receptor which is the receptor the virus needs to enter a cell. And you can see that there's a marked difference uh, between the lungs from non-COVID age match controls. So what you can see in these infected cells is increased senescence uh, with Centragore and increased P16 staining. You can grow alveospheres, which are organoids in culture, which are due to the proliferation of the alveolar type 2 cells. And it's more difficult to grow these in COPD lung samples because of the senescence. But what you can see is that the cells in the alveosphere of COVID-19 infected people uh, show senescence but no senescence is seen in the controls. And these senescent cells are expressing pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and IL-1 beta, which are the cytokines known to be increased in the circulation of people with severe COVID disease. So what we think is that SARS-CoV-2 infected AT2 cells secrete SAS mediators that may spread senescence beyond the lung. For example, senescence can be seen in the kidney of these patients. This may lead to systemic disease and increased mortality, but it may also account for long COVID because senescent cells persist. And we now have some data to suggest that the endothelial progenitor cells from long COVID patients with cardiovascular symptoms uh, are senescent. And that suggests that senolytic therapies may be effective in the treatment of long COVID and in preventing severe disease. And these possibilities are now being explored in other laboratories. So in conclusion, I've talked about COPD, but it's true for all chronic lung diseases and other chronic progressive diseases are characterized by accelerated aging with cellular senescence, which is linked to mitochondrial dysfunction and the release of SAS mediators. We've now elucidated the pathways involved in cellular senescence through oxidative stress, leading to a reduction in anti-aging molecules like sirtuins. We've shown that microRNA 34A plays a critical role in reducing sirtuin 1 and 6 to induce cellular senescence, whereas blocking 34A with antagomeres can rejuvenate COPD cells suggesting that aging could be reversible. Extracellular vesicles spread senescence, and we think this could account for disease progression and for comorbidities. Cellular senescence may also play a key role in severe COVID-19 and may be a mechanism 
for at least some people who go on to develop long COVID. And these pathways have led to the identification of new therapeutic targets, which include senostatics, but most interestingly, senolytics. Several are in development. And the attraction of such drugs is that they would only have to be given intermittently, perhaps only once a year. Because this is such an attractive idea, Google and Amazon have both invested more than a billion dollars in a search for new senolytic drugs. Because the idea of these treatments is that it would be a future treatment for chronic age-related diseases, including COPD and multimorbidity with the elderly. And the idea is not to prolong life, to, but to prolong healthy life. So it's all about prolonging the health span, delaying the onset of these devastating diseases. So the elixir of life is not yet here, but I think research suggests it's achievable. But it takes a long time to develop new drugs. And you can already do something to improve your survival through changes in lifestyle and particularly healthy diet. So resveratrol in red wine, antioxidants and flavonoids in fruit and vegetables, catechins in green tea, and quercetin in green apples are all effective against the aging pathways. And combining them in a Mediterranean diet has been shown to delay cardiovascular aging in mice. You can also activate sirtuins by calorie restriction. So people are looking at diets where people could activate endogenous sirtuins intermittently because this is something you couldn't tolerate. But also physical activity is known to prolong life and it may be through metabolic mechanisms that you're able to activate these anti-aging pathways. So I want to acknowledge all the people in our laboratory who've been working on these age-related pathways, particularly Jonathan Baker and Louise John Donnelly, Louise de Volder, who did the work on vesicles, and Coralia Pashalaki, who did the work on endothelial progenitors. I also want to thank our collaborators, including Vasilis Gorgoulis from Athens and Kostas Evangelou, and the people who have funded our research over many years. And I want to thank the Academy again for the great honor of inducting me as a foreign member. And I particularly want to thank Paris Roussos, the most famous medical doctor living in Greece today, uh, for all his friendship and support over the years. And I'm deeply honored to accept this membership. Thank you for your attention. Εμεί ευχαριστούμε τον καθηγητή Μπάντ για αυτή την συναρπαστική ομιλία. Η Ακαδημία Αθηνών τον καλωσορίζει και πάλι με ιδιαίτερη τιμή και του εύχεται κάθε επιτυχία στο έργο του. Λύεται η συνεδρία.